coral grows in an extraordinary variety of shapes and forms. This is pillar coral, and this finger coral. But they are all basically anemone-like creatures known as polyps, growing in vast colonies. Their tentacles trap plankton, swept past them by the currents. But they also extract calcium, carbon, and oxygen from the ocean and secrete a hard limestone-like base. The indentations of this hard base form a pattern to which the living polyps conform. The polyps of brain corals form continuous chains, and they construct the base on which they live accordingly. The building ability of coral polyps can be seen in the fossilized remains of a reef on the east coast of Barbados. Upheavals in the Earth's crust have lifted this ancient reef above the ocean surface. Made largely of fossil coral, its massive structures are the result of millennia of undersea growth. The long finger-like projections of a fringing reef continue the process of undersea growth in the coastal shallows. These underwater piers, or projections, built by the coral, form gradually narrowing surge channels, which together with the porous nature of the reef, absorb the power of the incoming waves. The fossil reef displays its labyrinth-like character and thrusts into view the eroded remains of ancient surge channels. This cliff, made almost entirely of fossil coral, stands high above the horizontal sediments that once formed the ocean floor. It must at one time have looked like this, the present outer reef at 30 fathoms, where the long strands of wire coral grow. At 10 fathoms, nearer the sun, there is life in abundance. There are sea fans and other gorgonians, close relatives to coral. And crinoids. Many reef organisms appear distinctly plant-like although they are animal. And coral itself, the polyps reaching out from their limestone castles into the ocean currents. Depending on the reef for shelter, but venturing above it to feed are the schools of fish. First, the brown chromists. and above them the larger creole racids. All this array of creatures feeds on the plankton that drifts in from the broad sunlit expanse of the surrounding ocean. The plankton has its own microscopic patterns of existence, its own special adaptations. But it is this immense drifting tide of almost invisible life that provides food for the schools of fish stationed above the reef and for the corals and other creatures reaching out from the ocean floor. There is a second food chain alongside the plankton eaters whose members often display fierce territorial behavior. These are the plant eaters, or herbivores. Algae grows in many forms, on the dead coral heads. And a dusky damselfish 
considers this field of algae to be its exclusive territory. Similarly, in the jungle of staghorn coral, a three-spot damsel defends its own particular property. Algae grows on the bare coral branches where the polyps have died. Husbanding and protecting this supply of precious food requires constant vigilance. But there are other competitors who seek to graze upon the algae in these Elysian fields below the sea. The nudibranchs, or sea slugs, have primitive sight and four sensing organs that lead them to their grazing grounds. Nudibranchs depend on effective camouflage for survival. The bright orange of this species may, at first sight, seem the very opposite of camouflage. But when the red part of the spectrum, provided by the artificial lights, is removed, it becomes less than a shadow. Only blue-green light penetrates deep into the ocean, and it is only the movie lights that reveal the orange color. These colors are never seen by the creatures of the reef. Two red squirrelfish remain camouflaged among the blue Creole wrasses until the light exposes them. In a coral cave, the bright red is visible only as the fish emerges into the lights from the blue-green shadows. But the reason for many of these brilliant colors remains one of the reef's mysteries. The markings, as opposed to the colors of the fish, are more understandable. They seem mainly designed to break up the outline of the body. The dramatic vertical bars of the banded butterfly fish and the streaming pennants of the juvenile jackknife fish would certainly confuse a predator. A heavy black band conceals the eye of this juvenile and of its adult counterpart. There is an almost universal attempt to provide false clues as to the position of the eye and to conceal its true location, which must mean that the position of the eye provides vital information to prey and predator alike. The pointed eye of a predator uses aiming lines to mark the limits of its target area, but there are also false round eyes of a non-predator to deceive the unwary. The tiger basslet also has an aiming line through a hidden eye. All these deceptive patterns, however bizarre, are obviously paramount in meeting the challenge of survival. While some can be readily explained, others are less easy to understand. This juvenile trunk fish is fairly similar to its adult parent. But it is difficult to explain the startling transformations between the young and old of some species. Why, for instance, does this juvenile French angelfish carry these strident bars that turn to the somber colors of the adult? Or what survival value lies in the brilliant blue spots of the jewelfish, which, 
on the fully grown adult are all but invisible. All these creatures of the daylight hours tell only half the story of the reef. At night, it is a different world with mysteries of its own. The small fish feed on plankton, for plankton swarm in even greater numbers under cover of darkness. Below them, a stingray glides in from deeper water. Barracudas are active at dusk. And scavengers, or detritus feeders, such as the hermit crab, go about their business with eyes that can see in the dark of night. Coral feeds mainly at night, with its tentacles fully open. And a soapfish, a predator with excellent night vision, picks its way swiftly between the coral heads. An octopus is out looking for crabs and clams. And a clam pumping water past internal membranes filters plankton from the night tide. A basket starfish climbs the branches of a gorgonian to spread its arms into the plankton-rich current. Dark vertical bands form the nighttime protective pattern of the four-eyed butterfly. And the doctor fish, which by day is a uniform dark brown, by night has a broken camouflage pattern as it lies asleep on the ocean floor. There are secret crawlers, such as the slipper lobster. And the peacock flounder surveys the night with periscope eyes. Although food is obviously a vital factor, it is shelter from predators more than anything that determines how much life the reef can support. As the day feeders set out, the night feeders take over their hiding places, and the limited shelter of the reef thereby sustains a double population. But this is the time when predators are most active. The marbled grouper is a stealthy hunter, deceptively slow, drifting in and out of coral caves, hoping to catch a night feeder not yet securely hidden, or a day feeder not yet alert. With daylight, the four-eyed butterfly fish have lost their nighttime camouflage. And the doctor fish now wears its full colors. But there is no time that is free of danger. A trumpet fish lurks concealed amongst the gorgonians. And the little jawfish builds a lair from which it can wait in ambush for passing prey. On the reef, there is no rule that says the hunter cannot also be the hunted. Although the porcupine fish is, in fact, no threat, the jawfish is obviously taking no chances.
the feeding Creole wrasses must be constantly alert for the large predators that cruise the reef. The schools acting as one organism with a thousand eyes stream downwards so that the intruders cannot cut them off from shelter. But in the competing demands of safety and the need to gather food with the least expenditure of energy, there are inevitably fine miscalculations. And a sudden strike means there is one less Creole wrasse to return to the feeding grounds. In contrast to these encounters, there are commensal or dependent relationships. A juvenile Spanish hogfish removes parasites that have latched on to a rock beauty. And a hamlet fish allows itself to be cleaned. Another parasite cleaner is the neon goby. It covers itself with a mucus that renders it immune to the sting of the coral. Creole wrasses are drawn to the coral heads where the gobies advertise that they are open for business. The larger fish, in typical head-down position, allow the small cleaners to do their work. A three-spot damsel guards her nest of eggs attached to the stem of a gorgonium, and thousands of mycids swarm under her protection. Instinct tells them that, being a plant eater, she will not attack them, but will instantly drive off any approaching predator. There are freeloaders, like the shrimp, that has acquired immunity to the sting of the anemone. It shares the food captured by its host without, as far as is known, providing any service in return. And there are shrimps that live within the spiny protection of sea urchins. Should a predator approach, they simply dive deeper into cover. Coral builds continually outward to the ocean and upward toward the sun. But inshore, room to grow is limited and here the forces of erosion gradually gain the upper hand. Urchins feed on the algae that coats the dead coral, and seen from underneath, their powerful teeth also grind away at the calcium carbonate itself, which contains a protein binder. They digest the binder and excrete the rest as sand. Urchins are close cousins to the starfish and come in many forms. This is a green urchin. And this, a pencil urchin. But urchins are not the only bioeroders. The beak-like mouth of the puffer fish is designed for eating coral. The larger parrotfish consumes one-third of its body weight of coral every day, digesting the live tissue and the protein, and excreting the rest as sand. parrotfish have scarred a coral head. A sponge competes with a coral for space. A crab provides a mobile home for small sponges, which in turn provide camouflage. In all these commensal and competitive relationships, 
there is inevitably waste and decay, but nothing is lost. The barber pole shrimp, normally a parasite cleaner, is not above joining the army of scavengers that pick up the living debris or detritus of the reef. To human sensibilities, these scavengers are perhaps among the most bizarre and the most beautiful of living forms in the reef community. Many types of worms live in tubular homes into which they can retreat from danger. Some equip their shelters with a spike to discourage pursuit. Unlike the sponges and gorgonians that feed on plankton, feather duster worms spread their fronds to filter out and consume the waste matter of the reef. The graceful and the grotesque together in their role as scavengers complete the cycle of living things that attend the reef. As part of a larger cycle, the reef fills outward to the ocean. And as it builds, it leaves behind its wave-battered and eroded remains to be ground into sand. For there is no sand here except that made from the skeletons of the reef. Protected by the outer barrier reef, the urchins do their work in the shallows work that is completed by the turbulence of the inshore waves. For 300 million years, coral reefs have supported some of the richest ecosystems on the face of the globe. But many are now threatened by the debris of human settlement. An oil spill would destroy, in a matter of days, the reef along many miles of coastline. After 40 years underwater, this wreck is beginning to support the growth of coral, but it may take centuries, if ever, to rebuild a reef and restore to it the living things that depend on it for shelter. It is essential, therefore, that we understand and protect these fragile sources of the sea's abundance.